How do I think the pyramids were built? To be honest, I have no answer to that question. And anybody who tells you that he or she knows how the pyramids were built are not telling the truth. Santa and I spent seven years of our lives uh, scuba diving all around the world. You're coming across statues underwater, you're coming across columns underwater. It's, it's, it's just magical, diving on an underwater city. For centuries, the lost city of Heracleion, or Thonis as it was known to the ancient Egyptians, was thought to be nothing more than a legend hidden beneath the waves near the mouth of the Nile River, off the modern-day coast of Alexandria, Egypt. It was a city whispered about in a few rare inscriptions and ancient texts until its discovery in the early 2000s. You have to be careful when you look at underwater structures. You have to look at all the conditions that have led to their submergence. Underwater archaeologist Frank Godio and his team unveiled this submerged city, transforming it from myth to reality in a groundbreaking moment for archaeology. Heracleion was not just any city, it was a vital gateway to Egypt, a primary port for Greek trade before Alexandria took prominence. This bustling hub was alive with commerce, culture and religion, serving as a significant centre for the worship of the god Amun Gareb. The submergence of those sites is largely because of subsidence of land rather than sea level rise, because it's relatively recent. Among its most revered ceremonies, was the annual Mysteries of Osiris, celebrating the resurrection of Osiris. Uh, but over here we have the god Osiris from Egypt, remembered by the ancient Egyptians as a bringer of the gifts of civilization, not only in Egypt, but in many other lands as well. The artifacts and inscriptions recovered from beneath the waters tell tales of this grand city. Located about six and a half kilometers off the coast, Submerged under 30 to 45 feet of water, the ruins of Heracleion have yielded an astonishing array of artefacts. Giant statues towering over five meters high, beautifully carved and remarkably preserved in the silty seabed, depict Egyptian gods and goddesses alongside pharaohs and Greek rulers, a testament to the cultural melting pot that was Heracleion. They came to Egypt and established religion by building primeval mounds up and down the Nile Valley. Alongside these, gold coins and bronze and stone weights, unearthed from the site, offer glimpses into the trade networks and economic systems that underpinned the city's prosperity. Adding to the intrigue, archaeologists found dozens of small limestone sarcophagi, likely used for mummified animals brought as offerings and the remains of over 64 ancient shipwrecks. These discoveries weave a narrative of a city where commerce and devotion to the gods were deeply entwined, a place of profound spiritual significance. Drawing parallels between Heracleion and the ancient city of Pompeii in Italy presents an interesting perspective on how natural disasters can both destroy and preserve. While Pompeii was buried in volcanic ash, Heracleion succumbed to rising waters and earthquakes. Yet both cities lay forgotten for centuries, their rediscoveries providing snapshots of ancient life. Pompeii offers a view of Roman life captured in ash, whereas Heracleion's story is told through artifacts preserved under the sea, offering unique insights into ancient Egyptian civilization. The ongoing exploration of Heracleion challenges our understanding of ancient history shedding light on the interconnectedness of ancient civilizations, The city's artifacts and structures, now emerging from the depths, serve as a potent reminder of the fleeting nature of human achievements and the intricate tapestry of human history. Now moving on to another discovery. The submerged ruins of Cleopatra's palace offer a fascinating window into the past. This palace, once a bustling centre of political and cultural activity, was home to Cleopatra VII, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Known for her intelligence, political acumen and captivating presence, the discovery of its ruins has thrilled historians and archaeologists, providing unprecedented insights into Cleopatra's era, a time marked by immense political power, cultural achievements and architectural splendour. 
the underwater excavations at this site have been nothing short of a treasure trove, unearthing a wealth of artefacts that tell the story of life in ancient Alexandria. Among the hall are magnificent statues that might have once graced the palace and its surroundings, depicting Egyptian gods, Ptolemaic rulers, and possibly Cleopatra herself. These finds offer clues to the artistic and religious milieu of the period. The submerged structures, thought to include the palace's living quarters and ceremonial areas, and possibly even the fabled Pharos lighthouse, give us a glimpse into the architectural and urban planning styles of the time. Moreover, everyday items such as pottery, glassware, coins, and personal ornaments have been found, painting a vivid picture of both the domestic life within the palace and the bustling economic life of Alexandria. Cleopatra's Alexandria was a cosmopolitan beacon of trade, culture, and learning, hosting the Great Library and attracting scholars from across the ancient world. Cleopatra's reign represented the peak of Alexandria's development as a hub of Hellenistic culture, merging Egyptian traditions with those of Greece and Rome. The underwater discovery of the palace highlights Alexandria's significance in the ancient Mediterranean world. Drawing parallels with the sunken Roman city of Baiae in the Bay of Naples, both Cleopatra's palace and Baiae were epitomes of luxury and political clout of their times, reflecting the architectural tastes and wealth of their civilizations. While Baiae reveals much about Roman elite leisure and architectural innovation, the underwater ruins of Cleopatra's palace open a portal to the end of the Egyptian pharaoh's era and the attempts by the Ptolemaic dynasty to synthesize Egyptian and Hellenistic cultures. The exploration of Cleopatra's palace continues to enrich our understanding of ancient Alexandria's pivotal role in the Mediterranean. It also offers a deeper look into the life and times of one of history's most enigmatic figures, Cleopatra VII and the lavish lifestyle she led. The ruins serve as a poignant reminder of Alexandria's former glory and the fleeting nature of human achievements, standing as a testament to the transformative power of nature over history. Founded by Alexander the Great in 331 BC, the port of Alexandria quickly ascended to become one of the ancient world's most crucial trade hubs, buzzing with the exchange of goods, ideas and cultures. Its prime location on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt established it as a pivotal connector of trade routes from Europe, Asia and Africa, transforming it into a melting pot of global significance. The strategic and economic importance of the port was unparalleled, primarily serving as the vital conduit for Egypt's grain shipments to Rome, which was essential for the empire's stability. Among the marvels that made Alexandria famous was the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Positioned on the island of Pharos, this engineering masterpiece not only guided ships safely into the harbour with its formidable light, but also symbolised the city's affluence and ingenuity. Although not directly linked to the port, the Great Library of Alexandria was another testament to the city's intellectual and cultural richness, drawing scholars and thinkers from across the globe. The royal quarters and palaces of Alexandria, including the Museion, home to the famed library, reflected the city's role as a beacon of Hellenistic culture and power. Meanwhile, underwater archaeology in the port area has unveiled a trove of artefacts, from ancient shipwrecks to everyday items, shedding light on the maritime practices of the time and the diversity of goods that flowed through Alexandria. The port was a linchpin in the ancient economy, bustling with the trade of grain, papyrus, glass and precious metals, among other commodities. Its docks and warehouses were a hive of activity, indicative of a well-organised network that made Alexandria a cultural and economic bridge between various civilizations. The discovery of diverse ship remains and goods in Alexandria highlights its wider reach in the ancient trade world. The legacy of the port of Alexandria is monumental, influencing maritime trade, architecture and culture well beyond its heyday. Ongoing archaeological work in the port area continues to enrich our understanding of the interactions, economies and daily life of ancient civilizations.
Its history serves as a powerful reminder of humanity's interconnectedness through time. The ancient underwater city of Alexandria, located at the mouth of the Nile River in Egypt, is a treasure trove of archaeological wonders and historical insights. Founded by Alexander the Great in 331 BCE, it quickly rose to become the cultural and economic hub of the ancient world. However, parts of this legendary city succumbed to the sea due to earthquakes and tsunamis over centuries. Diving into the depths of the Mediterranean, Frank Godio and his team's exploration of Alexandria's underwater ruins stands as a testament to human curiosity and technological prowess. The discovery of this ancient city submerged beneath the sea intertwines the grand narratives of history, technology and myth, offering a window into one of antiquity's greatest civilizations. The use of state-of-the-art technology, including submersible robots and sophisticated sonar mapping, marks a significant evolution in underwater archaeology, reminiscent of the groundbreaking exploration of the Titanic wreck. Yet, while the Titanic's discovery opened the deep sea to archaeologists, Godio's project breathed life back into ancient urban landscapes, showcasing the advancements in archaeological methods. The preservation of artifacts and structures found underwater presents unique challenges, starkly contrasting with those encountered in the preservation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The saltwater environment of Alexandria erodes materials over time, demanding innovative solutions for conservation, highlighting the diverse challenges archaeologists face based on the context of their discoveries. The uncovering of the royal quarters and temples in Alexandria offers unparalleled insights into the Ptolemaic dynasty's architectural and cultural grandeur, drawing comparisons to the discovery of Pompeii. However, Alexandria reveals its secrets from beneath the waves, providing a unique lens through which to view ancient urban planning and religious practices. When compared to other ancient submerged cities like Baie or Pavlo Petri, Alexandria's ruins underscore the city's cosmopolitan nature standing as a testament to its role as a center of commerce, culture, and knowledge. Alexandria's position as a cultural and economic hub in the ancient world is further emphasized by the diversity of artifacts found, echoing the melting pot of cultures found in Silk Road cities like Samarkand. The discovery of remnants believed to be part of the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, underscores Alexandria's advanced engineering and pivotal role in ancient navigation, much like the Great Wall of China's significance in its own civilization. The successful exploration of Alexandria's underwater ruins not only advances our understanding of ancient civilizations, but also inspires further technological innovation in underwater archaeology. This quest to uncover the past mirrors how the space race propelled aerospace technology, demonstrating the impact of historical exploration on modern advancement. Moreover, the cultural resonance of these discoveries, akin to the fascination sparked by the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, highlights the enduring allure of Egypt's ancient civilizations. Exhibitions of artifacts from Alexandria's underwater ruins have captured the global public imagination. Delving into the depths of the Mediterranean, the underwater excavations of Alexandria have unveiled treasures that paint a vivid picture of a city steeped in glory and history. Among the ruins and relics, a myriad of statues, sphinxes and architectural marvels whisper tales of ancient Alexandria's cultural and artistic zenith. One of the most breathtaking discoveries is a giant statue believed to depict Ptolemy II, an emblem of the fusion between Hellenistic and Egyptian influences that characterize the Ptolemaic dynasty. Crafted from red granite, this colossal figure stands as a bridge between two worlds, reminiscent of the Grand Colossi of Memnon in Luxor, Egypt and underscoring the tradition of monumental sculpture that flourished in ancient Egyptian culture. The seabed also revealed sphinxes and statues of Egyptian gods and goddesses. These findings not only highlight the Ptolemies' efforts to weave together their Greek heritage with the rich tapestry of Egyptian religious symbolism. The sphinxes, majestic with their lion bodies and human heads, serve as symbols of the ruler's wisdom and power, reflecting the broader narrative of Greek and Egyptian cultural intermingling. Furthermore, the recovery of architectural fragments from Alexandria's waters provides a window into the city's architectural prowess and urban planning. 
columns, capitals, and friezes bear witness to a city where Egyptian, Greek, and Roman influences converged, creating a unique aesthetic that mirrored Alexandria's identity as a melting pot of civilizations. This aspect of the discoveries draws parallels with the archaeological finds in ancient Rome, where a similar amalgamation of architectural styles speaks to a rich, interconnected Mediterranean world. The excavation also brought to light an assortment of pottery and jewellery, offering glimpses into the daily lives, trade and artistic expressions of Alexandria's denizens. The variety of pottery, from utilitarian domestic vessels to elaborately decorated ceremonial pieces, suggests a society of complex social strata and diverse needs. Meanwhile, the jewellery, gold earrings, necklaces and rings, often embellished with precious stones, underscores Alexandria's affluence and its pivotal role in the trade networks that crisscrossed the Mediterranean. These artifacts not only reveal the city's artistic flair, but also its connections to a wider world. Through these discoveries, the underwater ruins of Alexandria continue to fascinate and enlighten, offering a mosaic of insights into one of antiquity's most magnificent cities. When divers stumbled upon a shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera in 1901, Little did they know they were about to uncover one of the most astonishing artifacts of the ancient world, the Antikythera mechanism. Often hailed as the world's first analog computer, this device dating back to around 100 BCE is a marvel of ancient engineering and scientific knowledge. With its intricate system of over 30 bronze gears housed in a wooden frame, the mechanism was designed to predict lunar and solar eclipses, track the cycles of the Olympic Games, and model the moon's complex orbit showcasing a level of technological sophistication that seems centuries ahead of its time. But what's truly fascinating about the Antikythera mechanism isn't just its complexity and precision. It also served as an astronomical and calendar device, capable of calculating the positions of the sun, moon, and perhaps even the planets. It featured dials for the zodiac and solar calendar, embedding celestial phenomena within the fabric of timekeeping in ancient Greek society. Inscriptions on the device acted as a user guide, revealing a profound understanding of astronomy and mathematics among its creators and users. While the origins of this extraordinary artifact remain speculative, many believe its connection to Alexandria isn't far-fetched. Known as the intellectual beacon of the Hellenistic world, Alexandria was home to the legendary library and the museum, a research institution that attracted scholars like Euclid, Hero and Archimedes. Their contributions to mathematics, physics and engineering could very well have influenced the creation of the Antikythera mechanism, suggesting it may have originated from this vibrant scientific community. In fact, some scholars posit that the principles behind the mechanism could have been inspired by Archimedes himself. Although he lived earlier than the device's estimated creation date, the discovery of the Antikythera mechanism in a shipwreck hints at the extensive trade networks and cultural exchanges of the time, linking Alexandria with other Greek locales, including Antikythera. Such connections likely facilitated the spread of technological and scientific knowledge across the Mediterranean. The legacy of the Antikythera mechanism extends far beyond its historical and archaeological significance. It stands as a testament to the technological achievements of the ancient Greeks, challenging our perceptions of ancient technology and highlighting their sophisticated understanding of mechanical devices. Modern scientists and engineers have drawn inspiration from this ancient marvel, leading to new discoveries about ancient science and technology, and even the development of replicas using ancient techniques. Ongoing research, employing advanced imaging techniques, continues to unveil the secrets of the Antikythera mechanism offering insights not just into the device itself, but also into the scientific and cultural milieu of the Hellenistic period. Through the lens of this remarkable artifact, we gain a deeper appreciation for the ingenuity of the ancient world, particularly the pivotal role played by Alexandria in fostering a legacy of innovation and knowledge that continues to inspire to this day. The huge areas of the world that have never been looked at by archaeology at all or if looked at by archaeology, looked at only minimally. Of course, the most important are the flooded continental shelves, and that's why Santa and I spent seven years of our lives uh, scuba diving all around the world. Nestled at the westernmost edge of the Saurashtra Peninsula in what is now the state of Gujarat, India, 
the ancient city of Dwarka offers a narrative that is as rich in spirituality and mythology as it is in historical urban development. The calculation is that 27 million square kilometers that was above water during the Ice Age is underwater now. The city's strategic positioning near the confluence of the Gomati River and the Arabian Sea played a pivotal role not just in safeguarding it from potential invaders, but also in bolstering maritime trade and fostering connections with other parts of the ancient world. This geographical advantage, coupled with the city being enveloped by water on all sides, either as a peninsula or a series of islands, crafted a natural fortress that was a challenge for any adversary to overcome. Most of human civilization has been organized around water, right? And as the water levels change, some of those ancient cities could be completely covered. We did a lot of diving in southern India, so it was, it was great for her to be able to talk in their own language to Tamil fishermen and Tamil divers and see if they'd seen any weird stuff underwater, which they certainly had. Moreover, the Gomati River's proximity not only enhanced the city's scenic beauty, but also served as a crucial lifeline for its residents. Dwarka's urban landscape, as depicted in ancient texts, was nothing short of architectural grandeur. The city boasted of meticulously planned streets, a state-of-the-art drainage system, and formidable fortifications, all of which were divided into well-defined sectors for residential, commercial, and administrative purposes. We know that it's been underwater for about six or 7,000 years, but the question is, how long before that was it made? How long did it stand there above water? This level of urban planning and civil engineering sophistication showcases an advanced understanding of city management and infrastructure development, making Dwarka a marvel in ancient urban planning. The city's defensive structures, including a series of gates and fortifications, underscored the thoughtful defensive strategy employed in its construction. These were not merely architectural feats, but were strategically designed to regulate access and provide unwavering protection against invasions. Such architectural and strategic prowess points to a high degree of sophistication and indicates that Dwarka was a city that blended beauty with brains, making it a formidable entity in the ancient world. You're coming across statues underwater, you're coming across columns underwater. It's just magical in di diving, diving on an underwater city. Diving into the depths off the coast of modern-day Dwarka in Gujarat, India, archaeologists have embarked on marine explorations that have significantly advanced our understanding of the ancient city's grandeur and the sophisticated civilization that once flourished there. These underwater explorations have brought to light submerged structures, stone foundations, walls, pillars and steps that many believe were part of the legendary Dwarka, a city of immense importance in Hindu scriptures. The discovery of such elaborate underwater architecture points towards the advanced engineering and construction techniques of the time, hinting at a society that was far ahead of its contemporaries in terms of urban planning and infrastructure development. The use of modern technology, including sonar scanning, diving explorations and underwater photography, has been instrumental in mapping out the submerged city, providing us with a clearer picture of its complexity and the scale at which it operated, but the revelations don't stop at structures. A plethora of artifacts unearthed both from the seabed and land excavations near Dwarka tell tales of a culturally rich and economically prosperous society. The remnants of well-laid streets and an elaborate drainage system underscore a high degree of urban planning, indicative of a society that valued organization, environmental health, and the well-being of its citizens. Moreover, the variety of materials discovered suggests Dwarka was a bustling hub of trade and cultural exchange, maintaining connections with other civilizations of its time. This diversity not only showcases the city's economic vitality, but also its cultural openness and dynamism. But perhaps what's most fascinating is the chronological evidence unearthed through radiocarbon dating. We have to accept that civilization in, in India is, is, is at least 5,000 years old. The largely and correctly discredited notion of an Aryan invasion of India needs to be abandoned. Some artifacts and structural components of the submerged city have been dated back to the second millennium BCE, aligning Dwarka's timeline with that of Lord Krishna, as described in traditional beliefs and ancient texts. This dating not only cements Dwarka's place as a significant cultural, religious and economic center in the ancient world, 
but also bridges the gap between mythological narratives and historical reality. These archaeological findings offer a tangible framework to understand the evolution of urban settlements in ancient India, shedding light on societal structures, trade practices, and the cultural dynamics of the time. As we piece together clues from the past, Dwarka holds a special place in the tapestry of Hindu mythology and Indian ancient history, not just for its divine origins, but also for the mystery and majesty that encompass its story. At the heart of Dwarka's legend is its foundation by Lord Krishna, a pivotal figure in Hinduism revered across various traditions. The epic tales from the Mahabharata and the Bhagavata Purana tell us of Krishna's quest to protect his people from persistent threats, leading to the establishment of this city. It wasn't just a random choice, Krishna was strategic, opting for a location that offered natural defenses and prosperous living conditions for his subjects. Positioned on the western coast, Dwarka was a fortress against adversaries, thanks to its geographical advantages and access to vital sea routes that facilitated trade and communication. This city wasn't just a safe haven, it was a symbol of divine protection and ingenuity, blending spiritual significance with architectural splendor. The story of Dwarka, with its grand buildings and eventual mysterious submergence, captures the imagination, making it a subject of fascination and reverence. Dwarka, often hailed as the city of gold in ancient scriptures, embodies not just the literal application of gold in its architecture, but also represents an era of unparalleled wealth, prosperity, and architectural ingenuity. This legendary city, with its palaces shimmering with gold and precious stones, grand public spaces and formidable fortifications, stands as a testament to the zenith of ancient urban development and prosperity. The city's opulence wasn't confined to its material wealth, it extended to its sophisticated design and layout, which were attributed to Vishwakarma, the divine architect in Hindu mythology. Commissioned by Lord Krishna, Vishwakarma's vision for Dwarka was nothing short of architectural brilliance. The planning of Dwarka was meticulously executed, with distinct zones for residential quarters, marketplaces, temples and public buildings. This segregation ensured that the city functioned efficiently, with each area serving its purpose without encroaching on another. The residential quarters, designed for comfort and accessibility, were likely constructed with not just security in mind but also aesthetics, ensuring that the city's inhabitants lived in an environment that was safe, beautiful and harmonious with nature. But perhaps the most captivating tale of Dwarka is its mysterious submergence. The submergence of those sites is largely because of subsidence of land rather than sea level rise, because it's relatively recent. Legend has it that following Lord Krishna's departure from this world, the city met its end, swallowed by the sea. This story isn't just a pivotal chapter in Hindu mythology, marking the end of an era and the onset of Kali Yuga. It has also piqued the interest of archaeologists and historians. Their underwater explorations near the modern city of Dwarka have unearthed submerged structures, offering a tangible link to the city's legendary past. These discoveries hint at the existence of a significant settlement that might have gradually succumbed to rising sea levels or other catastrophic events, giving some historical backbone to the mythological tales. The submergence of Dwarka is often seen through a symbolic lens, reflecting on the ephemeral nature of wealth and the inevitability of change. It reminds us that even the most splendid creations, no matter how grand or well-built, are not immune to the forces of time and nature, this story, rich with historical intrigue and mythological depth, continues to enchant and provoke thought, bridging the ancient with the present and the mythical with the real. I, I want to talk about Antarctica. Mm -hmm. They are clearly protecting or preserving something that may or may not be under three miles of ice. There's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. The question is, was it lush and green during the lifetime of the human species? Yes. And this is where, this is where it gets tricky. Imagine embarking on an expedition to the frozen, remote expanses of Antarctica, only to uncover secrets of a lost civilization that might have thrived there in ancient times. This fascinating theory suggests that parts of a sophisticated ancient civilization could have existed on what is now the icy continent of Antarctica. This idea is tied to the hypothesis of Earth crust displacement. Whereby, from time to time, the entire outer crust of the Earth, like the skin of an orange, might shift. 
leaving the core of the Earth in place. Indicating that Antarctica wasn't always positioned at the South Pole, but might have enjoyed a more temperate climate long ago, making it hospitable for human life. However, this theory is not without its controversies. Does it happen at all is the, fir is the right. first question. I mean, of, of, of all the, the theories I've looked at and supported, this is the one that I've come in for the, for the most criticism for. The concept of such dramatic geographical shifts is viewed by the scientific community as highly speculative and lacking in solid geological evidence. The current understanding of plate tectonics does not support the possibility of the Earth's crust moving so drastically and quickly to reposition an entire continent from a temperate zone to the South Pole. But the theory delves deeper than just geography. It explores global myths, legends and religious texts, interpreting them as potential clues to the existence of this ancient civilization. Tales of great floods and cataclysms found in these stories are not seen as mere fiction but as allegorical records of real events that led to the downfall of this advanced society. The most important issue to me uh, is the issue of a global cataclysm at the end of the Ice Age. It is hypothesized that a major disaster, such as a flood or comet impact, could have been the cause of this civilization's disappearance from historical records, with survivors possibly dispersing around the globe and spreading their advanced knowledge to other emerging cultures. Of course, the most important are the flooded continental shelves. The sea level rose 400 feet at the end of the last ice age. Let's be clear, this was a rise that was extended over a period of 11 or 12,000 years. It did not rise 400 feet overnight. This leads to another intriguing aspect of the theory, the influence of this lost civilization on later societies. It is believed that the remnants of this ancient society played a significant role in shaping the development of well-known ancient cultures, such as the Egyptians and Sumerians. Similarities in architectural structures and astronomical alignments across different ancient sites are cited as evidence of a shared origin of knowledge. This suggests that these early civilizations might have inherited advanced architectural techniques, astronomical insights, and possibly other lost technologies and wisdom from their predecessors. The discovery of the technique to do longitudes that actually show the world as it looks during the last ice age suggests that somebody during the last ice age was mapping the world. Imagine a world where an advanced civilization flourished tens of thousands of years ago, long before the Sumerians of Mesopotamia marked what we consider the dawn of civilization around 6,000 years ago. This bold claim challenges the conventional timeline of history, suggesting that this sophisticated society existed during the last ice age or even earlier, presenting a significant puzzle for mainstream historical narratives that typically view complex societies and state-level civilizations as relatively recent developments. The evidence pointed to is as fascinating as it is controversial. It highlights the architectural marvels of megalithic structures like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, the iconic Stonehenge in England, and the majestic pyramids of Egypt and Mesoamerica, one of the many ways that Gobekli Tepe, I think, is going to prove to be a game changer is it's going to require us to reconsider uh, our whole dating sequence on megalithic sites around the world. These ancient constructs are not just stone monuments, but testimonies to an advanced knowledge of architecture, engineering and astronomy. Precise astronomical alignments of these structures, such as the alignment of the Great Pyramids with Orion's Belt or the solstices and equinoxes at Stonehenge, underscore a sophisticated understanding of the heavens. This expertise suggests that the people who built these monuments had a deep comprehension of celestial bodies, seasons and cycles. The theory extends beyond monumental architecture. It proposes that this civilization possessed advanced navigational skills, which could explain how similar architectural styles and astronomical knowledge appeared across vast distances, transcending oceans and continents. The scale, precision, and complexity of these megalithic structures indicate technological and engineering skills far beyond what has traditionally been attributed to prehistoric societies. Furthermore, the alignment of ancient monuments with astronomical phenomena hints at a comprehensive grasp of astronomy, deeply integrated into their cultural and religious practices. Evidence of sophisticated urban planning evident in the ruins of ancient cities suggests advanced societal organization and knowledge of city building. The global spread of similar architectural and astronomical insights among disparate ancient cultures indicates a shared source of advanced knowledge. 
This could have been disseminated by survivors of this prehistoric society, whose legacy might be the foundation upon which later civilizations built their own achievements. Journey back to the Eocene epoch and you'd discover Antarctica vastly different from the icy, remote continent familiar to us today. This fascinating period reveals a past where Antarctica wasn't engulfed in ice but was bustling with life. During the Eocene, Antarctica occupied the same position over the South Pole as it does currently. Yet the global climate was substantially warmer, enabling the continent to support a climate far removed from the frozen desert we recognize now. There was a lush rainforest that is now covered in miles of ice. Yeah, that, that's probably true. The Earth's climate was very different from, from how it is today. This era marked a time of significant change, with continental drift following the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. As part of the Gondwana fragment, Antarctica was gradually moving to its present isolated position, while continents like Australia and South America began to drift away, modifying ocean currents and climatic conditions. A notable difference from today's Antarctica was the absence of the vast ice sheet that currently covers the continent. The Eocene's elevated global temperatures meant Antarctica was devoid of this extensive ice cover, which had profound implications for the planet's climate. The lack of ice's high albedo effect, which reflects solar radiation, resulted in an even warmer Earth's climate. The tectonic activity during the Eocene was crucial in reshaping our world. The breakup of Gondwana persisted, and the formation of the Drake Passage between Antarctica and South America began to physically isolate the continent. This isolation marked a critical juncture in Antarctica's climatic history. Another significant development was the formation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current towards the end of the Eocene, or at the beginning of the Oligocene. As the world's largest ocean current encircling Antarctica, the ACC played a vital role in the thermal isolation of the continent. By circulating cold water, it established a climatic barrier that kept warmer waters at bay, leading to the cooling and eventual glaciation of Antarctica. Fossil evidence breathes life into the Eocene Antarctica, with forests of beaches, conifers and ferns indicating a much warmer and more humid climate than today's icy conditions. These fossils, including those of plants and pollen, demonstrate that the continent once supported a diverse range of flora and fauna. Sea levels during the Eocene were significantly higher due to the absence of large ice caps and the warmer global temperatures. This resulted in different coastal configurations, with areas now above water being submerged at that time. The elevated sea levels and warmer temperatures fostered a rich and diverse marine ecosystem, distinct from the current Antarctic marine life. Thus, when we contemplate Antarctica today, it's essential to remember that this icy continent once experienced a vastly different past, one that was warmer, brimming with life, and played a pivotal role in Earth's geological and climatic history. The Eocene Epoch, a captivating chapter in Earth's history characterized by dramatic climatic shifts and significant transformations in life on our planet. This period, stretching from about 56 to 34 million years ago, is nestled within the Paleogene period of the Cenozoic Era, famously known as the Age of Mammals. This era marked the flourishing of mammals, taking the stage after the dinosaurs exited at the end of the Cretaceous period. The Eocene sits between the Paleocene and the Oligocene epochs, with each phase documenting crucial geological, climatic, and biological shifts. Tectonic plates were on the move towards their current positions, influencing the oceans and sculpting the climate in profound ways. A notable event of this epoch was the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, which occurred around 56 million years ago. Imagine Earth undergoing a sudden temperature surge, with temperatures increasing by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in just a few thousand years, likely due to a massive release of methane from oceanic methane clathrates. This event significantly impacted ecosystems, leading to the extinction of some species while triggering rapid evolution and diversification in others, especially among mammals. During the Eocene, the atmosphere was laden with CO2, with levels ranging between 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million, far exceeding the pre-industrial levels of about 280 ppm. High CO2 levels driven by volcanic activity, the combustion of organic matter and the declining efficiency of carbon sinks enveloped the Earth in a greenhouse climate. This led to rising temperatures, altering weather patterns and ocean currents, 
and crafting a world vastly different from our own. The Eocene's warmer conditions had significant effects on marine life. Temperature changes affected marine currents, altering species distribution and fostering the development of new ecosystems. It was a period of change, new beginnings and dramatic shifts that laid the groundwork for the planet's future. The Eocene epoch, with its stories of warming, shifting and evolving, serves as a reminder of the dynamic and ever-changing nature of Earth. I believe that it's worth considering the possibility of a remote common ancestor which passed down key information that was inherited by later cultures. I'm willing to accept that the Great Pyramid was largely completed by the ancient Egyptians. But remember that the ancient Egyptians tell us in many of their texts that everything they knew was a legacy. Imagine stepping back in time way before the majestic pyramids of Egypt were ever conceived and finding yourself exploring the Blombos Cave on the southern coast of South Africa. Discovered in the 1990s by Professor Christopher Henshelwood, this cave has turned out to be a treasure trove of artefacts dating back about 100,000 years to the Middle Stone Age, offering a unique glimpse into early human culture. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. The variety of artefacts found in Blombos Cave is nothing short of astounding. Among these treasures are some of the earliest known bone tools. These weren't just rudimentary tools, but were delicately crafted, indicating a high level of skill and an advanced understanding of materials long before similar tools appeared in other parts of the world. The sophistication in these tools suggests that early humans were far more advanced than previously thought. But the artefacts don't stop there. The cave has also yielded pieces of ochre engraved with geometric patterns. Far from being mere decorations, these engravings are believed to represent some of the earliest forms of symbolic communication and abstract art, hinting at the complex cognitive abilities of their creators. There's uh, more and more evidence that cave art that was attributed to Homo sapiens was actually done by Neanderthals. This ability to think abstractly and to plan suggests a significant leap in human cognitive development, often referred to as the cognitive revolution. Moreover, the discovery of shell beads in the cave points to a culture that valued personal adornment and possibly had social or ritualistic practices involving these items. These beads could have been used in necklaces or bracelets, potentially serving as a form of currency or social stratification. When we compare these ancient engravings to the later, more detailed Lascaux cave paintings in France, a fascinating picture emerges. Although the Lascaux paintings, which date to about 17,000 years ago, are more visually complex, the abstract patterns and use of materials like ochre at Blombos may represent an earlier form of the same cognitive evolution towards symbolic thought and communication. This comparison not only underscores the continuity in human artistic endeavors, but also highlights the depth and richness of human creativity from its very beginnings. These findings from Blombos Cave challenge our previous assumptions about prehistoric humans and provide deep insights into the evolution of human cognition, artistic expression, and social structures. They paint a picture of a complex, nuanced society engaged in sophisticated practices and thought processes long before many other known civilizations. Let's travel from the ancient ingenuity displayed in South Africa's Blombos Cave to another fascinating archaeological site, Katalhoyuk in South Central Turkey. Discovered by James Mellart in the late 1950s and later excavated by Ian Hodder, Katalhoyuk has been a goldmine of information about Neolithic urban life, dating back between 9,500 to 7,700 years ago. Covering about 32 acres, Katalhoyuk isn't your typical ancient city. The settlement was incredibly well planned, with houses made of mud bricks built so close to each other that the roofs served dual purposes. Ceilings for the dwellings they topped and terraces for the adjacent upper levels. This unique architectural style suggests a highly organized society with no clear signs of social stratification, 
which is pretty unusual for such an early form of urban development. The residents of Katalhoyuk had a vibrant cultural life as evidenced by the elaborate frescoes adorning the walls of their homes. These murals, which were among the earliest known examples of narrative art, depict detailed hunting scenes and vultures, providing a window into the community's beliefs, rituals, and the environment around them. Religion appears to have played a central role in daily life at Katalhoyuk. This is indicated by the numerous figurines and shrines unearthed during excavations, with a notable prevalence of female symbols and figures suggesting potentially matrifical elements in their social structure. One of the most intriguing theories about Katalhoyuk is that it might have been an egalitarian society. The uniformity in house size and communal living arrangements support the idea of a proto-communist social order where there wasn't a significant emphasis on social hierarchy. This is further backed by the absence of grand tombs or palatial structures, which are usually indicative of pronounced social stratification. These comparisons not only highlight the diversity in how early urban societies could be structured and function, but also enrich our understanding of human social evolution. As we delve deeper into these ancient cities, we continue to uncover how our ancestors lived, worked and formed communities, providing valuable insights into the past that shape our knowledge of human history. The story of the Derinkuyu underground city in Cappadocia, Turkey, reads like something out of a fascinating mystery novel, complete with accidental discoveries and architectural wonders. It's really important to understand that archaeology um, is often driven by accidental finds. Located in a region celebrated for its unique geological features, particularly the soft volcanic rock that has been easily sculpted for millennia, Derinkuyu is the largest of the many underground cities carved into this landscape. Our tale begins in 1963, when an ordinary homeowner in Derinkuyu, known only to a few, decided to make some home improvements. Little did he know that knocking down a wall in his basement would open a door to the past. Behind the wall was a passage that led to a complex network of rooms and tunnels extending deep beneath the earth. What the homeowner had discovered was not a simple series of rooms, but an elaborate subterranean city that stretched down as much as 85 meters and included at least 18 levels. This ancient city wasn't just a refuge, it was a fully functional community with everything from homes and communal gathering places to schools, places of worship and tombs. When local authorities were alerted to the find, archaeologists rushed to explore this underground marvel. They were astounded to discover that Derinkuyu could have supported as many as 20,000 people along with their animals and stored food. The city's design was remarkably sophisticated with ventilation shafts that ensured fresh air could reach even the deepest levels, similar to modern day air conditioning systems. The city's architecture suggested that its creators were not only skilled builders, but also clever strategists. Massive stone doors could be rolled across passageways to seal off the city from invaders, and narrow tunnels would have forced any intruders to enter in single file making them easier to defend against. Derinkuyu's design is often compared to the labyrinth of Minos from Greek mythology, intended to confuse or trap unwanted guests with its complex layout and her minimal exits. This feature, along with its ventilation and security measures, highlights a level of planning and engineering that parallels the sophistication of certain modern infrastructures. The Altamira Cave, nestled in the picturesque Cantabria region of northern Spain, was brought to international attention in 1879 by Marcelino Sanz de Sotuola, who famously declared that its stunning cave paintings were of prehistoric origin. This initial claim faced a great deal of scepticism, but was eventually verified, proving the paintings to be an astonishing 36,000 years old, dating back to the upper Paleolithic period renowned for their vivid depiction of wild mammals and human hands. The paintings of Altamira are celebrated for their vibrant polychrome techniques. Artists of the time utilized an impressive palette created from charcoal, ochre, 
and hematite to produce colours ranging from deep blacks and yellows to rich reds. These pigments were not just randomly splashed on, but were applied meticulously with tools like fingers, fur pads or flint tools, pointing to a sophisticated understanding of materials and methods. The subjects of these paintings, mainly bison, horses and boars, are portrayed with a remarkable sense of movement and dimensionality that is rarely seen in other Paleolithic art. This dynamic portrayal suggests that these creatures were not only important food sources, but also held a significant place in the cultural and spiritual life of the people. The detailed depiction of their anatomy and behaviour reflects a deep observational skill and suggests that the artists were highly knowledgeable about their subjects. The realism and artistry of Altamira's cave paintings, especially the famous bison scenes, highlight the painter's extraordinary skills and their keen eye for detail. Some scholars believe that these paintings were used in rituals or shamanistic practices aimed at ensuring a successful hunt or invoking animal spirits, indicating that the cave might have been a place of great spiritual importance. Altamira's artists mastered the art of creating depth and movement through adept shading and contouring focusing more on realism and possibly the spiritual connection between the human and animal worlds. And nobody actually knew that it existed until it was accidentally discovered. It's about 5,000 years old, but we can't read that script. The script exists, but we can't read it. So there could be all kinds of information in that script. Discoveries of ancient texts in Egypt have significantly expanded our understanding of ancient civilizations, particularly those of ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome. These discoveries span various genres, including religious, scientific, literary and philosophical texts opening our eyes to ancient moments you had to be there to believe. In 1799, during Napoleon's ambitious campaign in Egypt, a remarkable discovery was made by French soldiers near the town of Rosetta, now known as Rashid. They unearthed a granodiorite slab dark and hard, which would come to be recognized as one of the most significant archaeological finds in history, the Rosetta Stone. This discovery was monumental not just for its immediate impact, but for the doors it would open in the field of Egyptology. The Rosetta Stone, dating back to 196 BC, bears a decree issued in Memphis in honor of King Ptolemy V. What makes the stone extraordinary is its trilingual inscription. The same message is conveyed in hieroglyphics, the script used for religious documents, Demotic, the common script of Egypt, and Ancient Greek, the language of the ruling administration at the time. This feature of the Rosetta Stone provided the crucial breakthrough in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs, which had been a long-standing mystery. Jean-Francois Champollion, a French scholar, made the groundbreaking realization in 1822 that by comparing the Greek text, which was already understood with the hieroglyphic and demotic texts, he could unlock the ancient Egyptian language. The text inscribed on the Rosetta Stone is essentially a piece of propaganda, extolling the virtues of Ptolemy V's reign. It commands that the decree be displayed in temples across Egypt, highlighting the practice of disseminating such declarations in prominent religious and public spaces. This aspect of the Rosetta Stone reveals much about the political and religious workings of Ptolemaic Egypt, illustrating how rulers use such inscriptions to communicate with and influence their subjects. Today, the Rosetta Stone is often heralded as the world's most famous slab of stone, a symbol of the key to unlocking the mysteries of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, dating back to around 1550 to 50 BC, offers an extraordinary glimpse into the spiritual life of ancient Egypt. Unlike what its name might suggest, the Book of the Dead is not a singular book, but a collection of spells, prayers, magical formulas and incantations, meticulously crafted to guide the deceased through the underworld, known as Duat, and into the afterlife. These texts, written on papyrus, were often included in the burial chambers, personalized for each individual, with spells selected for their perceived usefulness in navigating the afterlife. The evolution of these funerary texts from the pyramid texts intended for royalty to the coffin texts and eventually to the Book of the Dead, accessible to the wider population, marks a significant shift in ancient Egyptian religious and social practices. This transition indicates a democratization of the afterlife, suggesting changes in societal structures and religious beliefs where eternal life was no longer a privilege of the pharaohs, but a possibility for all. The spells within the Book of the Dead paint a vivid picture of the ancient Egyptians' beliefs regarding the afterlife, 
including the trials the deceased would face, such as the judgment before Osiris, the god of the afterlife. This collection of texts is invaluable for understanding ancient Egyptian religion, mythology, and views on life after death, portraying a complex belief system where the dead could continue to interact with the living and the gods. When juxtaposed with the Rosetta Stone, the Book of the Dead offers a different kind of bridge to the ancient past. The Rosetta Stone, discovered in 1799 and instrumental in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs, unlocked the ability to read countless texts from ancient Egypt, thus opening up a broader understanding of Egyptian civilization. In contrast, the Book of the Dead delves into the spiritual and religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, offering insights into their perceptions of death, the afterlife, and divinity. Though the Rosetta Stone and the Book of the Dead differ significantly, one being a bilingual decree and the other a compilation of funerary texts, they collectively illuminate the complexity of ancient Egyptian civilization. The Rosetta Stone reveals the administrative and political landscape, while the Book of the Dead provides a profound understanding of the spiritual and religious depth of this ancient culture. Diving into the intellectual and spiritual depths of ancient Egyptian civilization, two cornerstone documents stand out for their profound contributions. The Pyramid Texts and the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, each in its own domain showcases the advanced understanding and the multifaceted nature of Egyptian life, spanning the realms of religion and mathematics. The Pyramid Texts, dating back to around 2400 to 2300 BC, hold the distinction of being the world's oldest religious texts, Inscribed within the pyramids, viewed by the ancient Egyptians not merely as tombs but as portals to the afterlife, these texts served a crucial purpose. They were intended to secure the pharaoh's divine status after death, offering guidance through the underworld to achieve eternal life among the gods. With over 700 spells, the pyramid texts laid the foundation for future Egyptian funerary practices as seen in the evolution of the coffin texts and the Book of the Dead. Initially reserved for pharaohs, the democratization of these texts over time reflects a significant shift, suggesting an evolving conception of the afterlife that eventually embraced all Egyptians, not just the elite. In contrast, the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus from around 1550 BC delves into the pragmatic and analytical world of mathematics. Named after Alexander Henry Rind, who acquired it in 1858, this document served an educational purpose. It trained scribes in arithmetic, algebra, and geometry, encompassing practical problems relevant to surveying, architecture, and resource distribution. This papyrus not only demonstrates the Egyptians' prowess in fractions and linear equations, but also hints at their early approximation of pi, underscoring the practical implications of their mathematical knowledge in daily life and state administration. While the pyramid texts are steeped in the spiritual and esoteric, Aimed at guiding the deceased through the afterlife, the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus is grounded in the practical and worldly, focusing on mathematical education for administrative efficiency. Yet both documents illuminate the sophistication of ancient Egyptian society from different angles. The pyramid texts reflect the deep religious beliefs and funerary customs that shaped Egyptians' views on life, death and the hereafter. Meanwhile, the Rhine Papyrus reveals the pragmatic application of mathematical principles in managing the state's affairs, from architecture to the distribution of resources, highlighting the integral role of mathematics in the governance and organization of ancient Egypt. Together, the pyramid texts and the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus underscore ancient Egypt's remarkable advancements in understanding both the divine and the empirical. In 1945, near the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi, a discovery was made that would significantly widen the lens through which we view early Christian thought. A local farmer named Muhammad al Saman unearthed a sealed jar containing a collection of texts that shed light on the Gnostic beliefs flourishing in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Written in Coptic, these texts were hidden away, likely by a community that held them dear at odds with the mainstream Christian authorities of their time. The Nag Hammadi Library is a fascinating compilation ranging from gospels and philosophical treatises to revelations. It dives into deep theological debates and spiritual practices that stood apart from the orthodox teachings of the early church, emphasizing a personal connection and knowledge of the divine, known as Gnosis. Among its treasures is the Gospel of Thomas, notable for its 114 sayings of Jesus. This text in particular contains parallels to the canonical gospels, but also introduces teachings that were not included in the Bible as we know it offering new perspectives on Jesus' words and teachings. The discovery of these texts has challenged traditional narratives of early Christian history, 
unveiling the rich tapestry of beliefs that existed alongside what would become Orthodox Christianity. The Nag Hammadi texts paint a picture of a vibrant, albeit contested, religious landscape where various groups and sects struggled for spiritual authority and legitimacy. The act of burying these texts might have been a desperate measure by a community under threat, aiming to preserve their spiritual heritage against the dominating force of Orthodox Christianity. When compared to the canonical New Testament, the Nag Hammadi texts stand out for several reasons. They bring to light the theological diversity that characterized early Christianity, offering views on mysticism, the cosmos, and the nature of divinity that diverge significantly from the Orthodox path. For instance, their portrayal of Jesus often contrasts with that of the canonical Gospels, presenting him more as a spiritual entity and questioning the physical aspects of his crucifixion and resurrection. Additionally, while the canonical Gospels derive their authority from their apostolic origins, the texts from Nag Hammadi often claim apostolic or even divine authorship as a means to assert their legitimacy and authority.